quite a difficult film to then talk afterwards. I noticed actually as people were leaving, they probably, at that point, they've seen enough and they probably want to reflect on it and not listen to us talk maybe. But first of all, congratulations on getting this film made, which was great. Um, and I, I also can't talk about enjoying the film because I mean, I've watched it three or four times now. But should we just start off talking about showing or not showing? Showing horror or not showing? You made a, you introduced the film by saying you had to. Uh, other no. people would say you don't have to. So could we just start off talking about that? Well, if I may um, perhaps go on a sidetrack, which is relevant to what you're saying on this. Um, one of the biggest arguments, one of the biggest um, problems I had in starting and then putting the film together was with uh, the biggest organization in the UK that distributes and uses film like this or any film to teach about the Holocaust. And they, and I can understand why, but a long time ago, they put as their, uh, one of the sort of conditions of their organization that you should not show young people, um, and by young, I suppose anything from, say, 12, 13 upwards, <coughs> um, images of the dead. Um, that it traumatizes, it shocks, and um, is difficult for children in particular to grasp. Um, I maintained at the time of making the film, and, and have not changed my mind, on the contrary, I've, I've become slightly more hardened about it, that, uh, and certainly knowledge of my own children and other, peop other children and so on, that anybody who wants to watch graphic material in an age of the internet um, with two fingers can access any, anything of this uh, if they want to. They can, and they do. And I, my argument always about this is if you don't put material like this into context, then it's pornography. Uh, but if you do put it into context, then it, like the end statement um, by Richard Crossman at the end of the film, it um, is meant to be a lesson that hopefully other generations can learn from. And so you have to use that kind of graphic imagery. And um, you don't use it for any other gratuitous reason other than it is meant to show, number one, it's evidence of what happened at the time, um, and secondly, that it, it, it is the only way that you can actually grasp from a distance, as we all are, um, the brutality of what actually happened at that time. Um, so I've, I, you know, I've lived with several years of this graphic material, and as a filmmaker, I had to balance and try and argue and try and find out how much to use, how little to use, um, how relevant what I was using was to what I was saying in the film, as opposed to just putting imagery out for its shock um, uh, impression. Um, and you never know if you get that right, but um, uh, I, I, I mean, I just end that particular sentence by saying that you will be surprised to realize that there was only 12 and a half minutes of original footage from that original film, the German concentration camp film, 12 and a half minutes in this film. Um, it always seemed to me, you know, I could have used 70 minutes, I could have used 100 minutes, I could have used, uh, it always seems to me that it's more than 12 and a half minutes, but it isn't, it's 12 and a half minutes of that footage. So it's kind of, you know, it, it, it goes to show to some extent of how impactful that kind of material can be if you use yeah. it. I always think there's, there's something culturally about England as well that, that, that about, about us not seeing the dead. I, I remember certainly as a child not being encouraged to go to funerals and these were people who'd led peaceful deaths. Um, I'm married to a, a woman from Ireland for whom she'd seen death throughout her life. I think there's something. Um, what about uh, every filmmaker's got a story of 
people trying to get in the way of them telling the story. Did you meet much resistance to getting this onto screens? Um, <coughs> it's, 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 uh, I, 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 funny enough, I've not been asked that before, but it's, it's, it's interesting that there is a kind of a Holocaust weariness uh, to some extent in the media that it's kind of, oh, another film about the Holocaust. And you turn on the History Channel or you look at other, other broadcasts and so on, and there are, there are a lot of, there are certainly a lot of bad films about the Holocaust. Uh, there are a lot of rather mundane films, but there are also some very, very good ones in the past that can't get shown and re -shown. So initially, there was a, a kind of that well, we always show something, and Channel 4, for example, who actually ended up being one of the supporters of the film, initially were slightly dubious about having another film, but they kind of felt 70th anniversary, we've got to show something new, here is an in interesting and different take on it. But there was, there was absolutely no overwhelming enthusiasm. It was kind of almost by default that it got pushed through. And you look at the end of the film, mind you, you're exactly the same on Josh Oppenheimer's two films, and you will see between 15 and 20 co-producers, funders, financiers, broadcasters. You don't get films like this sort of made because somebody is coming up and saying, fantastic, here is the money. You have to battle all the way through the system and get a little bit here, a little bit there. I had about 12 different countries, sort of four or five different film institutes. Uh, Channel 4 came up with about a sixth of the budget in the end and almost as a buy-in. They came in quite late on in the process. Uh, the British Film Institute came in with a little bit, uh, American financiers. I mean, it was a, it was a struggle. So. Um, there wasn't, there wasn't a sort of an aversion to doing the film because everybody was intrigued by Hitchcock. You know, Hitchcock yeah. was a selling point. You, you flash the Hitchcock card and it's more important than the, the Holocaust because nobody knew what Hitchcock did during the war. Um, so that was a selling point. But, and that's why the Americans liked it. Um, but uh, in general, it was, it was quite a struggle. You, you, you uh, I think there's a, a, sort of an interesting story around uh, form, the form of the film. You, you'd, at an early stage, you decided to, to make it one way yeah. and then jettison that as a way. And so maybe if you could yeah. tell us a bit about that, because what we, what we end up with is, is eyewitness testimony. Well, it was, it was one of my um, hardest... Uh, one, of, one of the things I got most into trouble in, in the making of the film, I, having raised qu quite a lot of money to do it, I spent quite a lot of money taking eminent historians to the different camps, filming them in the context of the camps, explaining what happened to the camps and so on. And, you know, as a filmmaker, you can see that that might be... You know, I had the original film, the German concentration camp film, and I wanted to try and illustrate... Uh, its significance today and so I thought who better than eminent historians who knew their stuff. So we went to Auschwitz, uh, we went to Buchenwald, we went to Dachau um, and so on and, and I structured the film, the original film, to show and tell the same story but being explained slightly didactically by the, the, these historians in the camps. And at the end of it, uh, I showed it to various people at that time, but at the end of it, it felt like something you would automatically switch on and see on the History Channel on television. A kind of, um, I don't know, a kind of ordinariness about it. It didn't, it didn't and, and the more I spoke to people who were there, the, 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 the last characters who are behind the camera or victims or whatever, the more I felt slightly embarrassed to be using the academics to tell the story of, to tell their story. And I felt that this, this was their story and if they couldn't tell it, nobody should do so. And so 
all of that went on the editing room floor. So all the money and all the trips and the filming, about a year's work, junked and re-put the film together, um, of which I, I've, I'm almost uncomfortable having used it, but felt I had to use just three little episodes where people at the Imperial War Museum or at the uh, Washington Museum put a little bit of context, but the rest was all of them. And, uh, and I, uh, I maintain it worked far, far better as a result. But, yeah. but we'll, you know. we'll have some questions in a minute. Just I wanted to also say that there, there does seem to be something very strong, and maybe I say this as a man, but there seems to be very, such very strong when you're faced with men of a certain age who've held on to something for quite a long time. Mm. And, uh, and then releasing that. And you, you yeah. Well, I, 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 was, I was actually quite shocked myself at that kind of reaction. You realise that someone like George, at the, the, the soldier who, uh, in the yeomanry who lives in Wales, lovely, lovely man, and he hadn't told his story before, and he was you know, in, in the army at the time and had no expectation of what he was seeing and suddenly was confronted with something that he couldn't, even dream about. Um, and now, 70 years later, rec re retelling it and recalling it, you see the actually emotional impact of it. It was quite, quite extraordinary. Uh, fr from the victim's perspective, you kind of expect it. I mean, you know, it's not, it doesn't make it any easier, but you, you, you know that these are people who have re not rehearsed, but they've told the story before, they've told it to families. So People like George, I found, I found it sort of brought home to me the real psychological impact um, of, of that physical confrontation at the time, um, like nothing else. I, I, I found that quite extraordinary. Yeah, and um, you get the sense that they are really telling it for the first time. Yeah. yeah. Yes, oh, oh, with George. The, I mean, the, the character who was least emotional um, I found also very interesting was um, uh, Leonard Burney, the, 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 the officer who was one of the first in and then he became commander of the camp uh, after the war and looked after it. Um, and he almost apologised when, when I was talking to him about it. it sort of, there was a semi-apologetic thing about it saying, you know, I don't, I don't express I know I don't express emotion very strongly, and so on. That's, that's just the, my nature. It doesn't. I, do, I don't come across that way, and so you know, I, there was no way I was going to stamp on his foot and sort of say, "Well, show a little bit of you know, passion about that." So that's not the kind of character he was. But the others were all. So one, just a, a, apropos, an interesting news sort of item. Uh, Eva Kaur, one of the twins that you saw there with the, the light-coloured hair, um, is the same person who, if you had been following in the news uh, about two months ago, um, when the guard was, the, the secretary, the um, secretary was being tried for, in Germany for uh, working in Auschwitz, um, and 90 six-year-old um, secretary who had been instrumental in, in thousands of deaths. Um, she was the person who was called for a witness at that trial and then decided and, and actually caused a huge controversy um, dividing um, particularly the Jewish world into two, which was she decided she would forgive him in public. Um, and she actually gave him a kiss on his head um, in the trial and saying, if we don't get over this now, we never will. So I, am, I, I can't forget what you did, but I forgive you. Um, I, I don't know if anyone saw that in the press, but it was quite a sort of extraordinary... Uh, um, I, I hadn't spoken to her since after the film, so I was, I was unaware that this was coming, but that's what she, she did this year. So. <clears throat> What about, just um, for me, the, probably my last question for now, and then we'll go to uh, audience questions. The use of archive, it's a strange thing, really, because you've, you're making a film about people using archive and you're made using archive. Mm. So w w did you have a, a f sort of favourite archive moment where you find things and, and see stuff oh, yeah. for the first time that you... I was, 
I was the, 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 the sequence that I was most pleased with in film terms was the ability, uh, in particular near the beginning, of the British going into Bergen-Belsen, of being able to find either stills or moving footage of the same story being told 70 years later at the time in 1945. So the idea of Mania Salinger, for example, as the girl coming up to the barbed wire and being able to talk to her now, but finding her at that time in stills and, and recalling that moment that people like George drove through the gates. They've never met, they know nothing about each other. But being able to put together that little narrative storyline at the beginning where you could see the from different perspectives, exactly the same story, told today, but actually seen in imagery at, in 1945, actual film footage, I thought, you know, to me was the most extraordinary ability to use archive in that kind of context, um, and which I was certainly most pleased with, the right. ability to do that. Okay, there was a, there's some interesting stuff around mm -hmm. about artifice as well. You, you deal with the uh, liberation of the, by, by the Russians of one camp and talk about them have, getting their two, the cavalry crews getting there two days later and them to recreate. Mm. And we've heard lots of stories about recreation, but obviously the main uh, concern when you're looking at a film that's been made in 1945 is that it was for real. And there, I love some of the talking through about how would you show, make, how would you put the film together in such a way that it didn't look like it'd been made up? And mm. yeah, so mm. think, anyway, we should go to the audience. Uh, we've got a roaming, I hope, yes, we have. Um, we've got a microphone. So if you put your hand up in the air, the microphone will miraculously appear with you and you can ask a question or two. Um, there was one section in the um, film where the people of Thymore are paraded through Buckingham, I think it was, um, which is the sort of big, the, the narrative there is that all of the German people in some way responsible for the chaos. Uh, any comment on that at all? I, I didn't think that was... Personally, I wouldn't say that all the German people were responsible. It was that sort of intention. Yes, I think we're basically getting at what your view is on the idea that the German, the German nation were responsible for oh, right. as a whole. Um... <laughs> um well, um, I, I, I mean, the key in the, um, in, in the film, or the expression of the film, was what Bernstein said when he said that they were coming down to liberate the camps and um, uh, everybody denied they knew anything about it and, um, and he got this sort of sense of innocence in the people. Um, I think um, my personal belief, but I'm not a historian, so uh, you know, you're, 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 this is this is purely from the information that I get and have gone through this, is that it was um, it was a hugely well-oiled machine. It was it was the reason why, for example, um, um, uh, Hitchcock was so insistent on those maps was because he knew and he felt that everybody did know about it and he wanted to show that you couldn't, for example, take train loads and marching people through to Dachau, for example, through the town at that time to the camp and then people say, look, we didn't really know about it. So the thousands and thousands of camps that you saw on that map dotted all over yeah. Germany and Poland <coughs> and Holland and so on, um, you know, there must have been a, a lot of connivance and, and knowledge and exposure. I'm sure some people didn't, or people didn't want to know, so they blocked it out. But I, I think it's hard to believe that the majority of the German people didn't know that things were going on and that people were disappearing and that um, millions of people were vanishing and being persecuted and uh, whether they knew the extent of the gas chambers and so on. Uh, is, is, a, is another step, but in general, I think it was known. I mean, I've, I've been doing some research in, on the anthropological side of what was happening with anthropologists in Germany at the time, and the main 
the main um, uh, universities and scientific study centers were supporting this research. They had, they had decided and they knew that people were being experimented on and, and that, that um, people like um, Mengele was, for example, he had a doctorate both in medicine and in anthropology. And it was known that people like this were being sent from the universities to, to experiment and do rather dreadful things in the camp. So it was, it was not just a very isolated elite. I think it was very, very widespread. <coughs> OK, and <coughs> thank you for your question. Another question, please? Do you, I just ask about your opinion, do you blame religion in that time, government Nazi or German? Do you, do you blame religion or do you blame the nation uh, in terms of what happened at that time? He's asking whether you blame religion about that or whether you blame the, the German people without repeating that answer to the previous question. I don't. Um, it's I interesting, don't it's blame interesting that people are asking your opinion on things, though, isn't yeah. it? I, I certainly don't blame um, religion. Um, I don't think that's uh, a, a factor in this. I mean, National Socialism was... Um, very ambivalent about religion in any case. It was, um, it was far more, uh, I think the sort of underlying thing is far more, I think what comes up uh, in Josh's films and what, in, the, in the preamble to the film here about human nature and the ability of human beings to act like this to fellow human beings for whatever reason. Um, whether it's um, a matter of race, religion, culture, um, colour of skin, whatever. And, uh, you know, Josh's point that he was making about what was happening in Indonesia was that hopefully we, we can get beyond that and we can understand and therefore change things as we go along. Um, I've... I would love to agree with him, and I'm generally an optimist and believe that people have it in them to change, perhaps. But you also realise this is in 1945, that what happened in Indonesia was in 1965. Uh, you've got what happened in Rwanda, you've got what happened, you know, I mean, you can take 10 or other. I think there was a very interesting list that went up, in fact. Um, and you realise that perhaps some people learn, but there is clearly the ability of society to act in a, a rather bestial way to other members of a society or people who are slightly different, um, <laughs> wherever we are and whoever we are. And I think, I think the, the sad fact is that we find it necessary to categorise what I would call the the character of the other. You, you look for, if you like, a scapegoat. In, in case of Nazi Germany, it was the Jews, homosexuals, um, <coughs> the, the disabled, and so on. The, the Romani got incredibly badly persecuted and killed and so on. And it was any category that you can label that is not you uh, as the central core of people. Um, in Indonesia, it was slightly different because you could not, except for the Chinese who were also persecuted, the communists were a political creed. They weren't the other. They weren't different people. They were the same people. They were villagers living side by side. They were just politically believed in something different or they were thought to. Um, but in general, most of the most of the genocides that I've looked at have that same category, which is it is people who are slightly different in some category and therefore seen as a threat and that society is able to go to that extreme um, in, in, in that kind of brutality uh, against them. And it's, it's, a, it's a hard learnt lesson. I, and I think, I don't think we've learned it yet, but I think I hope that more and more we view it, the more and more we somehow pull ourselves up, even if we have our own prejudices against others, that we can stop short of what happened perhaps in, in Nazi Germany. Did, did you, 
I, I, I was struck, I just wondered whether, when I was watching it, I was struck by the fact that you, uh, in terms of the edit, there is, there's that, the, the word Jew or Jewish doesn't appear as, there as much as I'd have expected to. Was that a conscious decision? Um, not really. It was, um, I mean, I think we all know that the Holocaust is regarded as a, a Jewish diaspora and a Jewish persecution, although other communities were equally, I mean, not numbers, but equally persecuted and killed at the time. Um, but, I, but it was not... I think the, the, if there's any message in the film, it is not because these people are Jews per se, it is because they are being persecuted by the central state, whoever they are. So, you know, I, to start differentiating between who was a Romani and who was a political prisoner, Buchenwald had, had many, many political prisoners who were persecuted and killed at the same time. But that wasn't what the story was. It was the ability of that regime to act in that kind of brutal manner against fellow human beings. And so it, it, it was not... Um, I mean, I know it's a Jewish story, but it was not... The film was not a Jewish story, per se. OK, OK. Another question. Um, I wondered if Bernstein and, and Hitchcock had any... Had any had any reaction to that? I mean, were they were they happy as the letter said? You know, was Bernstein happy to let it go and uh, well to take over, or what, what, what happened there? Whether Bernstein and Hitchcock were happy, or happy, or, or did they object to the film being dropped at that uh, point? Yeah, yeah. Well, um, there's a there's a kind of a very complicated, which I kind of couldn't really go into in the film backstory behind all of that. Um, the reason for the film being stopped, uh, number one, was, uh, I think, relatively clearly explained because of political inconvenience at the time. Um, but Bernstein, who was my first boss in television, uh, incidentally, which was an interesting uh, coincidence, Bernstein had, um, was a perfectionist. He, he definitely took too long in putting the film together. It could have been finished earlier and it would have been out there. But he kept on wanting to add bits, do other things, get the Russian material, get more American material and so on. And the process then started getting longer. Um, <coughs> The, there is a very cynical part of me that has to sort of acknowledge that part of the relationship with um, Hitchcock was uh, a, a, a somewhat selfish one from his point of view because they were already setting up their business in New York <coughs> and, and then Hollywood before this time. And there is a kind of a, 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 a rumour, but a, a sense that Hitchcock partially came over so they could do their business, and then a month later, back they go and they start their feature film business in Hollywood. So there's a kind of slightly uncomfortable feeling that although he was passionate about this film, he had other things on his agenda. So definitely he was distraught about it not succeeding, and he claimed later in his life, in the 19, late 70s and early 80s, that it was his biggest regret that he never did finish the film. Um, but he never talked about it to his daughter, for example, who uh, I've been in touch with a lot, and his son. Um, he never discussed the film with them. He never mentioned it. It was only one mention to Caroline Moorhead, the journalist, that he said... I really regret this, but I think she pushed him into that kind of position. So it's it's a very there's a very there's a great ambivalence there. I think there's a it's not just regret. I think there's an element of guilt in that. Um, it it raises, if I may, just a slight indulgence. It raises one other point that I'm I'm always fascinated to sort of try and explain about the non-showing of the film um, and 
and what happened with Bernstein was that, um, that the letter you saw that came up in the film that said, um, you know, it, uh, the, the, the CNC will want no atrocity film. That letter was the only actual proof we have that from on high the film was stopped. There, was, there are no other documents. We've gone through, we've combed through the archives. But that, I mean, that's strong enough. But to me, it's very interesting because that letter was issued in July, two weeks after the elections. So two weeks earlier, Churchill gets kicked out. Attlee comes in. Attlee's not interested in foreign affairs. He's very much domestic. His... Foreign Minister Ernest Bevan, uh, who was left to deal with all of that, Ernest Bevan was very virulently anti-Zionist and had made it his feelings known and was accused by a lot of being anti-Semitic, which I think is questionable, but he was definitely anti-Zionist. And he was wanting to protect the British interest in Palestine. So the reflections that that film would have been in an embarrassment to him and would have provoked more and more sympathy in areas that he didn't want people to even think about is, is quite true. And so two weeks later, after him becoming foreign minister, the foreign ministry sends a letter down stopping the film. Now, you know, it, for me, it's inconceivable that those two events are not connected, but we have no evidence of that, but it's pretty clear that it wasn't a conspiracy, but the film was too late, a uh, new foreign minister didn't want it, things were happening in Germany that really, you know, starvation beginning in Germany, um, the, the, the um, commanders and so on in Germany were saying, look, we've got to get these Germans on our side, things are too bad, Cold War, Russia's now the enemy, or the Soviet Union is now the enemy, not the Germans. We've beaten them. Why rub their noses in it? Let's go, let's, let's move on. And all of that combined at that one particular moment in time in July, August of 1945. So it's not, you know, I'm shocked, and I'm sure everybody's shocked that that film never got made. But when you look at it in the context of all the things that were happening and the war still being fought in Asia and so on, you you can kind of not condone it, but you can understand it, I think. How do you feel I about... I don't feel bad, Donald Trump. I, 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 don't know, I don't know. How do you feel about <laughs> Donald Trump? Thanks, Natty. I think, I think Donald Trump needs a haircut. <laughs> <laughs> what filmmakers do is drawing these things together and trying to bring it into the present and saying that people like Donald Trump, there is there's some resonance with what Donald Trump is saying and what we're seeing at post-Second World War. I'm troubled, I'm troubled with the question, I think, but... Well, no, the, I mean, the only reflection I would have in sort of contemporary terms is the somewhat obvious one is that we have to be absolutely ultra-cautious and sensitive about how we demonise other people. And the whole migrant issue, the whole, what, Trump talks about in, in terms of not just migrants, but the Mexicans in, <coughs> in America and so on, um, is very dangerous, dangerous territory. And it, it just seems that you have to be super vigilant not to let it tip over into areas that you can't retrieve. And people that, I mean, you know, this is obviously a, an extreme, but that is, that is the beginning of that pathway that you have to be very cautious about. <clears throat> I have to say, I still find... I, it, obviously, that you're portraying the extremes of human behaviour. But actually, still for me, when I watch, and I've seen quite a lot over the years, it's still for me, it's the, the aspect of bystanders. It's people who, all the way through, have hinted that they probably knew what was going on, but to chose to turn the mm. turn away from it they're always it's always so that's mo most shocking and the other thing if i am seeing dead ever seen dead bodies it's dead children and bring it into the present that's been what we've seen more recently when we saw 
uh, a drowned child as an image mm. that went round the, mm. the internet. Mm. Well, the latter thing is the... the emphasises the power of imagery to shock and horrify people. You know, that one image of the child in the sea mm. had repercussions, extraordinary repercussions, and it's just one image. And so one hopes that the, you know, that kind of imagery can have that, that impact. So I think that, that, that's important. The, um, I've now forgotten what no, the No, no, sorry, I, I've also forgotten what it was as well. <laughs> uh, it's just the thing about bystanders. Oh, yeah, it's, the bystanders. It's, it's, it's very... Well, the, uh, you know, yes, we're, we're, we are horrified and we, we, we can always sit back in our armchairs and be sanctimonious about how ter terrible it is that people don't do things and don't interfere. Um, but you also have to, have to be honest, I think, and say how... It's, I think Josh made that point as well. Yeah. How do you react? in a totalitarian state <coughs> when you know that your action is going to cause possibly your death, certainly your imprisonment and the persecution of your family and everybody else. What do you do? Do you stand up and be counted and, and have you got that kind of physical courage, let alone moral courage to do it, or not? And it's, you know, I, it's, I, I think as he said, you, you kind of have to be in that position to know if you are able to do that. And clearly most people can't do that. And I think that is the mass, you know, it, it doesn't condone things, but it's the mass excuse that the German people will give that they might have known, but there's nothing they could do about it. Um, and I think we, we all face those kind of conundrums in a greater or lesser degree in our everyday lives as well. We just don't have the extremes that they were faced with there. So I'm, I, you know, I don't forgive the German people and such, not that it's mine to do so, but it's, um, but it, you know, you have to, I think, also be a little bit um, understanding of what you know, they put themselves into. They voted that government in, although it was only 50% of the vote, but they voted that government in. So they claim that that point in 1933 was a kind of a democratic choice. And the fact that it rapidly became to totalitarian um, probably took the majority of the German people yes. aback. Uh, yeah. Initially, they were quite happy with it because it seemed to be doing good and the glory, greater glory of the fatherland and so on. Um, but then rapidly, I think most people were horrified. But I don't know. It's, okay. a, it's a long philosophical it is. debate. Which we probably won't we'll get to the end of tonight. Oh. But is there any more questions? Yeah, in the middle here. Um, I was just wondering, I know a lot of the eyewitnesses obviously were very upset when they started talking about the Holocaust. But did any of them need a lot of convincing to start talking about it? Or were they very willing to open up and recount what happened to them? Yeah, would people just open up, uh, in terms of the people in the film, are you saying like, was it took, take a lot of effort to get people to open up? Do you, um, do you have to spend a lot of time with people? I suppose it's the artifice of filmmaking. Do you have to spend a lot of time with people to open them? It's kind of not, not, a, not a... I don't have a clear answer to that because some, some people were very keen and enthusiastic and wanted to tell the story. Um, <coughs> and other people, uh, I mean, there was an element of, you, obviously you had to get an element of trust and they, they had to believe that what you were doing was something that was going, going to be of some benefit. And they were, I think, all, all of them. I, mean, I, didn't use, I had many other interviews that I didn't use in the film, but um, I think without exception, um, everybody saw the point now, before it was too late, in, if you like, unburdening themselves uh, with their stories and their family stories in the background. Um, most of the interviews of the people there were preceded by a long interview about their whole, their whole history. 
So I talked about their background, where they came from, uh, their family description, how they got to the point. Um, in the end, the film was about a particular point in time, not about their backstory. So I wasn't telling how the pogroms and you know what happened and so on, because uh, that wasn't really the point of this particular film. But the people who spoke to me were keen to tell that part of the story as well, even though it didn't appear. And um, I'm glad to say they weren't annoyed that I didn't use that, but, uh, but it, uh, that's kind of the filmmaking process. You, you have this vast amount that comes down to a tiny amount in film. Um, so yes, there was an element of time, an element of trust, but it was, I wasn't trying to do covert, hidden filming about things that people didn't want to tell. Um, it, their reluctance was simply because it was an emotional roller coaster for them. And, um, so some of them took time to um, to unburden themselves. Yeah. Any other questions? Um, in my opinion, I think we've held the German people to account quite quite substantially, um, and we always speak about the German people in these situations. But I wonder if you feel the British people and the American people uh, should take more responsibility for their actions post the Holocaust and their their reluctance to take in, you know, these stateless people. I mean, do we need to look at ourselves and, um, and wonder again now that we've got the same situation with Syrian refugees to an extent, do we need to look at ourselves and say, well, are we allowing history to repeat ourselves in this respect? And should we hold ourselves to account for that? Yeah, so it's the, the, the focus on, on, on the, uh, uh, Germany and Germans uh, and and now shouldn't we be looking at ourselves as British people and Americans and holding ourselves and looking at, at our role in this story and also in the present, uh, present crises? Well, I'm not sure about how or what our role in this story um, quite means, because this was... <coughs> this was um, if you like, it was our role in this story. I mean, it was the... British soldiers, the British looking after things that were happening in the camps at the time, particularly in Bergen-Belsen and the Americans and so on. Um, so I, I can't quite, I don't quite understand what at that time we should be looking at our, our, our role there. Um, if you're saying should we be um, aware of our ability to do the same things in contemporary society or be in that position. I mean, I think we've, we've, we've kind of gone round that particular story. I'm, I'm, uh, so I'm, I think I'm flailing a little bit about to understand okay. what the question is. It's okay because uh, we've watched the film, we've subjected you to some questions. Mm. Um, we should probably wrap it up now. And let me just say, uh, before saying thank you, if you, if you go online and uh, search for you, there's, a, there's a, an hour 20 of an interview. That's some, I can't remember who did it. Somebody did an interview with you that's online. It's one of the first things on the Google searches. And you talk, you can't even remember, you talk a lot about your life story. Oh, is, this, what, is this Alan McFarlane? Yeah, Alan McFarlane. Oh, so, right, right. so you get to that point. So if you want to learn more about the backstory, personally, I'm quite, we haven't had time to do it tonight, but quite often with filmmakers, it's quite nice to know their own backstory and work out what they bring of themselves to the films that they make. So I don't make any crass observations from that, but maybe have a look at it online. But for now, I'd like you to put your hands together and thank Andre for this. Thank you.